content of the webinar, I'd like to cover some of the logistics associated with it. We certainly want the webinar to be informative and valuable for you. So we have the opportunity for you to ask a question uh, during the presentations made by our expert panelists. Uh, just simply in the ask a question or Q&A box uh, on the platform is to enter your question and we will hold those questions uh, till the end of the webinar and address as many as, as we can. If you have any technical issue with regard to your connectivity, uh, please use the chat box uh, and our production staff will be monitoring that and will try to assist. Uh, thirdly, we have a survey being conducted at the end of the uh, webinar that we would certainly ask for your participation in, in that it provides excellent feedback for us in terms of the value that we're providing in these webinars, as well as uh, understanding what topics you would like to us to address uh, in the future. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and the recording of the webinar, the presentation deck, as well as a transcript of the presentations uh, will be made available generally within a week of that on our webpage that you see the, the link to that. Uh, next slide, please, David. For those of us joining for the first time, let me quickly tell you a little bit about the work of the Retail Payments Risk Forum. Uh, here at the Atlanta Fed. Our primary functions are research and education. On the research side, we do the triennial payment study. And just last week, uh, we released the 2021 Survey and Diary of Consumer Payment Choice, which is the only national survey that uh, tracks cash usage by consumers. Uh, we hope that you will use those research uh, documents in your work, uh, especially those of you in the ATM field, uh, looking at the activity of cash over the last several years as impacted by uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, the other aspect is education, such as the webinar that we're uh, conducting right now. We do a weekly a blog as well on different uh, payment issues. Matter of fact, the blog this week uh, discusses uh, some of the changes in payments with regard to uh, online ordering of or online payments uh, in the food, both uh, grocery as well as casual and fast food uh, dining that you might uh, find find interesting. So again, we hope that you will use our our web page as a resource. Uh, for the future. Next slide, please, David. As far as our agenda today, uh, we're going to start off with introductions of our moderator and our expert panelists who are going to cover these three areas. Uh, the attacks against personnel, both service personnel as well as cash and transit uh, personnel. Uh, then we'll look at the virtual attacks against the ATM channel. Uh, followed by the brute force attacks, the physical attacks against the ATMs themselves and looking at some of the activity and the trends that have taken place. As I mentioned before, we're saving some time at the end uh, to address the questions that you have. So again, feel free to add your questions uh, as you listen to the content on any follow-up that you would like to have. So next slide, please. With that, I'm pleased to introduce David Tente, who will serve as the moderator for the webinar. Uh, David is the executive director of the ATM Industry Association, as well as the executive director of the ATM Security Association. David will further introduce himself, as well as each of the panelists. Uh, David, I turn the virtual floor over to you. Well, thank you, Dave, for the kind introduction and the opportunity for ATMIA and its members to participate in, uh, in this webinar. 
I'm sure that many of you attending today are already familiar with ATMIA, the ATM Industry Association. Uh, for those who are not, we are a global not-for-profit association that represents the interests of the entire ATM industry. Uh, the largest single segment of our membership is uh, ATM deployers and operators, which includes uh, the largest commercial banks, community banks, uh, credit unions, and uh, also independent operators of, uh, of, of all sizes. In addition to uh, hosting the world's largest ATM-focused annual conference, uh, we also advocate for ATM-friendly regulatory environment, uh, develop operational best practices, uh, offer basic ATM channel online education, and uh, produce a wide variety of industry reports. Uh, ATM IA membership is open to uh, any industry stakeholder. Uh, the U.S. is by far our largest region, but we do have over 11,000 individual members representing over 500 organizations that are based in 66 different countries. There's uh, one additional dimension to ATMIA, which has been uh, become quite important. Uh, we also own and operate the ATM Security Association. So after the rest of the panel has introduced themselves, I'll be leading off the discussion with some information about general ATM uh, crime trends here in the US. So, uh, like the uh, each of the uh, other panelists now to introduce themselves, and uh, John, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the forum. Uh, Loomis, uh, I've been with Loomis now for uh, several decades and been running the security side of things since the mid '80s. Um, we're heavily invested in uh, the ATM industry. Uh, currently run uh, a little over 10,000 employees there and each day and deploy uh, a little over 2,100 routes. Uh, we're servicing 106,000 ATMs uh, across the country. And annually, we touch those ATMs about 5.6 million times. Then it runs into about 53 or 54 touches per ATM in the course of a year. Um, and, and through that, my group uh, works on dealing with the threats and counter, counter, uh, countering the threats. We, we break that down into two areas. Uh, some of my colleagues will be covering this, but uh, burglaries against the units, uh, robberies, the attacks against the individuals, uh, skimming, and then jackpotting. Um, and then inter internal side of it too. My group also investigates all the internal threats. Uh, we, if we cross load an ATM, if we leave a safe door open, uh, any kind of internal theft or any kind of policy schemes as it relates to ATMs. Uh, we are quite busy as a group. I've got 17 very good investigators that work for me, as well as the entire claims team within Loomis. So uh, going on to the next, next one, please. Thank you, John and uh, Brad. Good afternoon. Good morning to where you are. Uh, my name is Brad Moody with Lowers Risk Group. Um, some of you may have heard of our organization where we we basically work in the, the areas of fidelity crime focused on risk mitigations uh, globally. So we've got offices strategically located around the world to help with the London market, specifically towards the, the fine art and specie markets and the remediation of risk. We work very closely with all the financial institutions and armored carriers to work with them collaboratively to uh, work in circumventing solutions that work within their areas where their ATM risks or their, their money risks or theft risk. And we help kind of try to condense and, and stop those with mitigation areas. We oftentimes are leveraged with the various industries to look at corporate best practices, to work on uh, rewriting those practices, to understand exactly the immediate threats and then take the expertise we have to kind of cross pollinate those across the industry. And thank you, Brad. Uh, Brenda. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Brad, uh, for the pass off. My name is Brenda Bourne and I am one of the supervisors at FBI Minneapolis field office. I've been with the FBI for just over 17 years. I have a slide here just giving you a little background on the FBI. We were established in 1908. We have between 35 and 36,000 employees. Of those employees, about 14,000 are special agents and about 22,000 are support personnel. 
Here at the FBI, we have 56 field offices across the entire United States. Like I mentioned, I am with FBI Minneapolis, and FBI Minneapolis not only covers the state of Minnesota, but we also cover North Dakota and South Dakota. And besides the offices that we have here in the United States, we also have just over 60 offices across the, uh, the globe, and they cover uh, over 200 countries, territory, or countries, territories, and islands. And just to give you some priorities, we have a lot of priorities that we cover in the FBI, one of them being violent crime. And for me specifically, I oversee the Violent Crimes Task Force, which is where the ATM violation falls under. Uh, thank you again for having me. I'm looking forward to the presentation. I'll turn it back over to David. Thank you, Brenda, and thank you all panel. Uh, thanks to everyone who's uh, attending this afternoon's webinar and, and those who uh, might be listening to uh, recordings at some point as well. I'm glad to lead off the discussion today with a brief uh, high level overview of uh, some of the ATM crime trends that we're seeing and how the ATM Security Association is now able to track those trends. Uh, everyone in our industry is concerned about the rapid rise in, in ATM crime. Uh, it's been growing significantly over the past year or so, in particular, really got a bump in uh, during the pandemic. But also, unfortunately, many of us in the industry, uh, perhaps like yourselves, who need to know what's happening in the way of criminal activity, uh, have only had a few sources uh, for that kind of information outside of their own fleet. More often than not, uh, it, it comes from uh, news sources, uh, even then, probably not uh, yet, unless there's uh, you know, been multiple in incidents in your area, perhaps an explosion, uh, somebody got hurt. Uh, it, bottom line is it, it's a lot harder to protect your ATM fleet if you don't know quite what it is that you have to protect it from. Uh, that situation is, uh, is changing now. Uh, we don't have enough time today to go through the history of this project. But uh, the ATM Security Association launched the first and only global ATM crime database in May of last year, the Crisis and Crime Management uh, Intelligence System. One of the things that uh, we learned very quickly is that criminal activity in the ATM channel is, is not homogenized by any means. Uh, the report you see here is on the homepage of the reports and statistics uh, section of uh, the website. And as is uh, displayed towards the top of the page, there have been 14,613 incidents reported from over 2,400 uh, reports going back to uh, May of last year. Uh, and that's the, the total count globally. Now, this data was captured towards the end of September, so it, it's still pretty current. Uh, as you see, the pie chart there shows that 75.5% uh, of the incidents reported are fraud attacks and 24.5% uh, are physical attacks. Uh, now, of course, when you're looking at numbers like this, you'd often want to know what type of fraud attacks are being experienced because that, again, helps you in defending yourself against uh, these types of attacks. Now, it may surprise you to see that the largest number of attacks globally are a, a, a method called cash trapping with uh, card theft being in second place, followed by skimming. Uh, skimming, uh, which you may have expected to be in first place, is, is, is not globally. As I mentioned a minute ago, the, the first thing we learned was uh, how different these trend, trends are from, uh, from region to region. So we're looking now at, uh, at uh, the US market. The previous numbers were all global numbers. Europe actually aligns pretty well with that data. Uh, this chart is, is for the U.S. market, and if you look too quickly, uh, it's a very similar pattern to what you saw in the previous uh, pie chart, except that the numbers here are completely flipped in the U.S. Uh, we have 77% physical attacks compared to 76% globally being fraud. So quite a bit, uh, quite a bit different in, uh, in, in those numbers, and as I say, it does uh, change quite a bit from region to region. Now, we're, we're still looking at the U.S. market here, but uh, now we're drilling down into uh, fraud attacks only. And the breakdown is very different from what we saw with the global numbers, uh, where cash trapping was uh, the most common type of attack globally. Uh, it's just a very tiny sliver in the U.S. And although skimming is no longer the primary problem worldwide and overall in the industry, it, it's still the most common form of fraud attack here in the U.S. 
So still very much an attack factor that, uh, that we and, and operators need to be prepared for. Uh, what's a little bit unsettling in these numbers is that uh, we've got a growing problem with jackpotting since uh, uh, it's up to 10%, as you see here, since uh, jackpotting requires physical access, though, and, and we lead the world in the rate of physical attacks. It's not hard to understand why those uh, numbers are growing. You uh, may have noticed, too, that a, a heat map has been displayed to the left of these uh, pie charts. It shows uh, here, for example, that California and New York are experiencing more instances of fraud attacks than, than other states. And uh, we are hearing uh, directly from our members and anecdotally that uh, these two states have been experiencing a very high rate of fraud with regard to uh, MagStripe uh, benefit cards. Uh, and my last slide, uh, we, we have a breakdown of the different types of physical attacks in the US. Uh, I suspect that most of you probably could have uh, predicted that the chart would look something like this. Uh, theft of uh, the ATM itself has uh, taken over as uh, the most common type of attack. Uh, together with theft from the ATM, they account for almost 98% of physical attacks. And the heat map confirms that uh, Texas is, uh, seems to be the king of uh, hook and chain activity. So I, I hope with this, I've, I've given you some sort of a general sense of uh, the high level trends that we're seeing in the industry and, and uh, how we're able now to track that uh, activity. Uh, if there are any representatives of uh, law enforcement uh, on the call today, um, uh, please know that uh, we're happy to provide you with uh, free access to this system. It, it's really very helpful for the whole industry and, and uh, law enforcement itself to be able to have uh, a way to uh, share that information. Uh, a little more globally. So just uh, please let me know of your interest. Uh, now we're going to go on to our uh, panel and uh, John, uh, our panelists are going to be able to fill in uh, a lot more of the details surrounding these issues and I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to them. Great. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Um, interesting note that, uh, when I, and I'll talk about Robbie a little bit, uh, that uh, some of the Robbie trends we have around the country match uh, uh, some of the events you show up on the on your data as well in terms of consultations in Texas and consultations in California. Um, ATM personal attacks, uh, obviously extremely dangerous. Uh, it's what we face every day as we go out and service ATMs. Um, the uh, one of the biggest distinctions between the United States and the European Union is that we have a high number of drive up ATMs here in the United States. Uh, most of the uh, ATM serviced overseas are done in either kiosk or in wall ATMs. And uh, while most of our ATMs are done in a drive up or a standalone kiosk, and that puts us uh, at a little more risk as we're servicing these units. So uh, go on, please. Yeah, so the targets that uh, usually are threatened uh, in, a, in one of these attacks are uh, the CIT carriers that replenish the ATM. And, uh, you know, that there's a certain amount of time we spend doing these and uh, we're exposed. And also the FLM providers, uh, the group that uh, goes in and clears cash jams and goes in and fixes the ATMs if there's any kind of issue with them. Uh, as they approach an ATM or go inside an ATM, they're also exposed to that. And we have uh, several of our uh, uh, banks that we deal with have their own personnel conducting do the deposit pools, whether they go into the ATM daily or every other day. Uh, if one of the uh, CIT carriers don't do that, the banks are doing that. And of course, when they access an ATM to do a deposit pool, they're also uh, exposed. Uh, the, the location, as I said earlier, for ATMs, we occasionally get attacked at um, the at end wall ATMs, but most of our attacks, about 95% of them, as it relates to ATM, occur at drive up ATMs or in standalone kiosks, right? And to give you an idea how pervasive it is in the United States for us, uh, in the last five years, uh, all CIT carriers. Uh, including the Loomis. There were 202 attacks, uh, armored car robberies, attempted to take down, attempted uh, car hijacks. 107 of those occurred at ATMs, while only 29 actually occurred at banks. So the uh, perpetrators of these uh, have identified that 
Uh, it's a better solution, better, uh, easier attack uh, position to do that. And I'm going to show you a slide in, in, a, in a little bit that will kind of demonstrate that. Um, very high level of violence in these attacks. Uh, 37 attempted homicides over the same period of five years uh, with four um, carrier employees killed and two bystanders killed in attacks. So they can be uh, extremely violent, extremely dangerous. Um, and uh, that's what we, we're dealing with on our counterventures and, and approaching this. So next slide, please. Yeah, I took one of our attacks that occurred uh, last year to kind of demonstrate how quickly these occur. Our, our, um, our tech, uh, you know, leaves an, eight, leaves an armored truck. You can see how we parked the truck very close to the ATM. Uh, so we've minimized the distance uh, between the truck and the ATM. And uh, while uh, she was in there, uh, you know, we're about to open up the ATM to settle it, um, the uh, perpetrators came up on the inside lane, the one that is used for uh, handling deposits in the drive up window. Uh, pull up very quickly. They exit. This is a two person crew that did this against our uh, tech. Uh, they jump out. They um, uh, assault our uh, tech on, on scene. Um, she had a bag, as you can see, to her left side. Uh, and in that, she, by the way, she didn't have any cash in there. She was getting ready to settle the ATM. Um, and they grab the bag and uh, order her back to the truck. And as she's walking back to the truck, they fire around overhead and into the truck, right? And then they escape. This entire attack took about eight seconds. Uh, very quick. Um, uh, we're dealing with a bunch of these right now in the Southern California area uh, and very violent. Uh, go ahead. So we got some fairly uh, common uh, countermeasures that uh, all of us use. And, you know, one of them is, uh, We've upgraded our vehicles over the last several decades to very high security level vehicles, right? Uh, we've done very focused anti-robbery training uh, at, at, and using different venues, using different uh, techniques on how to uh, avoid these kinds of situations. Uh, we have a very specific location approach on how we approach an ATM that we're about to service and where we park our vehicles, how we park our vehicles. So you probably noticed in that previous slide, how that vehicle was parked with the door that she was exiting out of right next to that ATM. Uh, that is a purposeful move on our part. And the key is for us is to reduce the amount of time at an ATM. Uh, unfortunately, because of servicing these ATMs, you have no choice but spend some time. By the time you settle an ATM, open it up, pull out the cash, and uh, replenish it. Uh, there is an amount of time involved. So um, we try to exchange currency in secure environments when possible. Uh, sometimes that'll occur in the back of the truck. Sometimes that'll occur in a kiosk if it's available. Unfortunately, sometimes that's right there at the ATM itself where you're exposed, right? So what we, as we deal with our customers uh, and the ATM owners, we talk about uh, that. We partner with them to kind of cover this and, and reduce the threat, right? We want to reduce the steps needed to service an ATM. Uh, when we first started in the ATM market, there were probably about eight or nine settlement schemes used to go in and sell an ATM. They're well over 80 now. So, you know, our crews have to be, uh, spend a lot of time uh, as they move from ATM to ATM, refamiliarize themselves that uh, you have a different approach as you settle that particular ATM. Uh, Ensuring good coverage, CCT coverage around the ATM is critical. As you can see, uh, that, that location we were dealing with had very good coverage, in addition to what we had on our vehicle um, that uh, you know, gives us, uh, that helps us in the investigation side of this after we have one of these events. Um, and uh, monitored alarms in place. This is mostly, this is in place in a lot of locations where they're monitoring, they have alarms monitoring the ATM. So when you open up an ATM, it's monitored and they have a hold of feature within that uh, that will allow uh, one of my people to send a, uh, a threat alert immediately. So um, go on, please. Yeah, I wanted to bring this up. Um, uh, you know, this is more of an attack against the unit, which one of my other, which one of our other colleagues will be covering later. But uh, this has become a big trend in the U, uh, Europe. 
right? When we had gas attacks at ATM, they, they're pumping uh, uh, a fuel and oxygen into these with a detonator, and uh, they're literally blowing out the ATM from the front to access the cassettes that are inside. Um, as opposed to the US, where we have drive ups and they, they attack us. In these cases, there's a lot of attacks against ATMs. Uh, go on, please. Yeah, I, uh, again, uh, this will be covered by one of my uh, one of the other colleagues on the panel. But uh, you know, one of the things that we've seen is we we respond to these uh, from our customers when they call us and they say that hey, we have an ATM that's attacked. And one of our customers had come up with this is several uh, companies that have produced this kind of a uh, securing the ATM so it can't be attacked from a hook and chain point of view, right? And uh, you know, an armored car crew. Uh, and, Will, will arrive on scene. They'll have a key to open up that gate so they can open up the ATM. Um, some of these are very, very sophisticated. They come with remote monitoring that uh, when you open up that gate to, uh, to access the ATM, uh, they're aware that that's being opened. They know how long it's open uh, and they can uh, react to that uh, from a remote perspective as well. Um, go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I talked about, we really approach things from two points of view. Uh, you know, one of them is the external attacks, the robberies, but we also have internal attacks that, that we, uh, we attempt to uh, cover. So unauthorized access to safes, uh, very simple countermeasures we put in place, we use auditable locks, one-time uh, encrypted locks, um, good coverage of uh, CCTV at the ATM, and with modern alarm systems all help and any kind of unauthorized access to a safe uh, other than when we're in there servicing it. Uh, this is a straight internal issue for uh, Loomis and other carriers that do this kind of work. Um, there's been in a, uh, an explosion of multi-denominal, multi-denomination ATMs in the system. As a result of that, uh, we occasionally uh, put the wrong denomination in the wrong set. So, uh, our countermeasures we put in place and working with our customers uh, is make sure that they're properly labeled, the cassettes are properly labeled both inside and out, uh, that the cassette slots, if the machine is driven off of where the cassette is put into the machine, is properly labeled. And, uh, you know, we always work with our customers to try to limit the number of denominations that are used in an ATM, because not only does that create a, uh, a potential of this type of loss, but also the longer we're moving different types of denominations to an ATM, the long, much more time we're spending out there. Internal theft uh, is something we all face and we deal with. Uh, again, we use audible locks uh, with these encrypting uh, schemes. We've got very good arrangements with the FLM providers who may also access the ATM while they're, where they're while, uh, during a cycle of a loss. Uh, we've got excellent investigation protocols on, uh, on this and we constantly train our investigators on how to deal with that. And uh, what we do to, to countermend any uh, potential internal theft is we do a whole bunch of random ATM audits every day. We go out and randomly audit ATMs after they've been serviced to make sure they're in balance, that all the money was put in properly. And then on a regular basis, we randomly swap our ATM crews. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, Mr. Moody uh, for his side of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, JT. So during this this side, we're going to talk about the the new kind of bank property and and, and cyber fraud and kind of some of the uh, the definitions and some of the occurrences that are that we're seeing. Um, and uh, to reiterate what what David had said earlier about the the new ASA uh, data, it's it's very very good data to have, and it really does help the industry. So we we continue to encourage people to use the tool. If we go next slide, please. So again, the next form of bank robbery, the, some of the things that we're gonna talk about within my segment are cash trapping, we'll, we'll describe all those and skimming. I think we all know what skimmings are. Jackpotting is, is, a, is a very popular term now. I'll describe why that one is, is of significance. Uh, the same with deposit trapping and, and cash trapping go hand in hand. Fraudulent deposits is, you know, I think we may have seen the old times where people would put wet money, wet $1 bills in there, and they would say that, hey, I, I deposited uh, $400 instead of, you know, 10 wet $1 bills to kind of create that fraudulent deposit. 
And then the mobile app compromises. So this is very new in the advent of the walk-up ATMs with the mobile app um, authentications. Next slide. So it makes you wonder why why is there a huge advantage with cyber comparative to just as you know, unfortunately, robbing the CIT carrier or the or the independent um, ATM owner that's filling or, or the even the bank that's to pull in deposits or, or replenishing their own ATMs. Well, you don't need a weapon, so you don't really need to to have that that show of force. Uh, the tools that you need, um, you can actually buy all the tools from the dark web. It tells you exactly what to do by the product name, by the ATM model, um, exactly the tools you'll need, and where and how to do how to do the crime. You don't have to do. You have to interact with people. So you'll see these. You know, someone will go in at two o'clock in the morning, um, and they'll they'll empty the machines, or they'll go in and, and you know, and they'll use the drilling techniques to, to implant the, the jackpot devices. Um, the other you know, this is considered property, car, property crime. So when you look at the, you know, if you were convicted of, of skimming an ATM or, or jackpotting ATM and you get, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's, it's a property crime. Um, whereas if you go through and you rob your CIT carrier, that's, that's a, a much harsher crime and very, very stiffer penalties. Um, the speed that's, that's done within this is is incredibly fast, and it's hard to trace. So a lot of things that happen, um, you really can't you can't nail it down very easily. If we can go to the next slide, please. So this is kind of what you know what we see through the data that's out there, and, and I can explain why it has such a, a sharp increase. But one thing I want to make sure we identify is. You, I don't want this to falsely say that in 2022, hey, something great has happened, or hey, look, we have a decrease. That number is only through the end of April. So, if we were to add, if we were to add to current dime, it would be it'd be almost a straight up and down arrow at this point. And so, the, the natural question is, well, you know, that's interesting. And so, why is that? So, when you look at you know the simple answers, a lot of the operating systems that were running to support the ATMs, those are no longer supported. So now you look at the the security patches and updates that are within the machines are no longer available. So that creates an exploitable uh, event. And so the, the cyber criminals are able to, again, identify by the types of ATMs um, exactly how to exploit that. So we, we unfortunately, we, we see this kind of existing to increase. However, the, um, the uh, manufacturers are, uh, are doing some great things in um, making the, the access devices a lot more hard to access or where you have to have, you can't, the simple tools won't work. And then also banks are putting in a lot of details that are out there to uh, decrease the uh, the abilities. Um, there's also some countermeasure activities that are going on there. So there's actually even one device that we, we have feel very strongly and very passionate about that. You can actually implant the device inside of a cassette. It's very small. It's about the size, a little bit, a little bit larger than the size of a cell phone, but it can actually listen for certain identification marks. So it can listen for drilling events if it's a if it if it hears a drill it sends a alert to the bank's SOAC and then it also will disable the machine turn the machine off so little things that are or if it hears you know a tug or somebody wrapping a chain around the ATM it can turn it off and and, and alert alert the uh, security operations center so these are exciting things that are now coming out to advent okay, next slide kind of breaking down what's going on in the world itself so um, you know, as David said, you know, about 30%, 27, 27, 29% of the events in the U S are cyber and the rest are physical. So, you know, um, you know, Americans would much rather rip the ATM out of the, out of the ground because as JT said, you know, there are, there are no real drive through areas in other parts of the world, the, the drive through ATM and the, and the kiosk ATM. Um, is very selective into the U.S. market. It's not a lot of through the walls. So, if you're you can't really wrap a chain around something uh, that's inside a wall, um, it's fun to watch them try, but that's uh, it doesn't really work that way. But then when you look in the areas of like South Africa, where it's just so simple to just have you know 18 people with automatic automatic rifles enter into a shopping center and they just they they just start they start off very violently. So they they start off shooting. Um, because that's easier to get the money. The quality of life and the, the assurances of life there just don't exist as they, as they, uh, as they do otherwise. 
So, but the, we do see an increase in the cyber um, world coming in. The interesting thing about the, the cash trapping, I'll, I'll kind of describe that, why that's such an important piece um, and why that's a little inverse relationship within the U.S. This cash trapping is as simple and as elegant as gluing the trap door shut on the cash dispenser. So what that is, is someone who goes in, they put a, a, an adhesive on the, on the cash drawer. They watch three or four people go through remove cash and the door doesn't open. So they, you, know, you see them, you see the, the, the customers, they can't get the cash out. They get frustrated and they walk and they go inside the banking center. Or they, oh, they get frustrated and they walk out. So right behind that is someone comes in with a pry bar and they pop that door open and they remove the $200, $300 that's, in, that's trapped behind the door. So very low limits of cash, but that's, that's the easiest and most elegant way that, that the cash trapping is happening. Skimming is not going away. So skimming the actual, the devices are getting thinner and thinner. So where we used to see where the, the card readers, you would see it's modeled, it looks exactly like the, the manufacturer's card reader. Now the internal components that are, with, that are inside, the thickness of them are half the size of a dime. So when you look at that, they're able to internalize the, the skimming device itself and the, the pen reader or the, 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 that goes inside the fascia with the camera it's, you can't even, you can barely even see that it exists. So it's, it's very, very unique. And uh, they're getting much, much better about the, uh, about the, the fascia, uh, replicating the fascias. Card theft is as simple as they're, they're putting in the same kind of, uh, the same, same kind of devices to um, trap the cards that's, that are inside. And they go through in there and they pop the fascia off and they, they pull it, they pull the, uh, uh, the, the cards out of it. And they also have your, they also have your pin number at the same time, because they've seen you try to enter it into the, to the, uh, to the ATM. We can go to the next slide, please. So again, kind of looking at this and the, so your jackpotting is really kind of, it's not new, obviously. So first time it happened in the U S is 2018, 18 ish. The first kind of known, known event was in 2015 in Mexico City, as far as we know. So, but why this is an important thing when you look at, it's only 0.3% of the problem, but when you look at the amount of cash that's taken, it's actually the most lucrative way that cash is being taken. So dispenser jackpotting is as simple as they try a, a very small hole into a strategic location. They enter an endoscopy scope to find out where the actual USB tray is. And then they go through and they enter in a device and they load malware onto the machine. That's going to turn that machine into a jackpot, or it's going to start dispensing cash and won't ever record those actions. The other way that's happening is they're actually replacing the motherboards with a, uh, with a piece of equipment that will take certain key indicators, but it actually reverses transactions. So you're as, as they go through and they're, they're the, the actors are removing cash from the machine. They're hearing the sequence of, of numbers. And it actually dispenses the cash, but it never records on the EJs or any kind of electronic journals or anything that's out there. So that's that's why that's an important piece of that um, to to make sure that it's all understood. We can go to the next slide. So here's some kind of just some pictures, graphic examples. So the the one on the left is you know glued cash, which is interesting for on the the U.S. side. Um, it's much easier for the, the uh, European markets in Canada, where it's polymer uh, polymer cash, it's easier to remove remove the the glue itself. That card skimming device is one of the older ones. I need to update my deck, but the new ones that, that we've just found uh, on this. But it's, it's, again, the new ones are very very thin. You can't actually even see that it's there. I would stress for the FIs to understand that to have a a, a clear card skimming procedure that with their, with their employees as they are cleaning, inspecting ATMs daily, as they pull on it, they notice something to have a very clear procedure in there because typically when someone's skimming has a card skimming device, they are sitting close in proximity with a Bluetooth where they are actually recreating cards in close proximity to that. So you, some people could argue that the banking center employees could be a danger by if they pull off the skimming device and they hold it up and like, hey, look at this. Well, you know, that costs money and the, the, the gangs, the mules, they want to have that back because they're personally responsible for them to pay back their, their person that's, that's hiring to perform these, these tasks. And then cyber jackpotting. So this is again, where we are implanting um, actually code into the machine 
to dispense currency at a very, very fast rate. Within a matter of minutes, you can actually dispense $500,000 out of an ATM in a matter of less than two minutes. So that's why this is a big, big, significant thing. You can go to the next slide. And turn it over to uh, Brenda, if you can, please talk to us about your physical tax. Great, thanks, Brad. Uh, like David had mentioned earlier that the COVID, we saw an increase in um, ATMs being targeted with banks being closed during the uh, pandemic. One of the other things we had seen an increase in during uh, 2020 was also banks and ATMs becoming targets during civil unrest. Is um, As there was civil unrest across the United States, we saw the increase in banks and ATMs being targeted. So in looking at 2022, the top three ATM physical tax that we are seeing in law enforcement, number one remains the hook and chain um, tactic that is used where they are getting a chain in the area they're at, they are stealing some type of truck, a lot of them have been uh, Ford F-150s, and they are using the truck with the, train, with the chain in order to gain access into the ATMs. The second tactic that we are seeing is the brute force. Brute force with using crowbars or pry bars, saws, blow torches, some type of power tool or hand tool in order to gain access into the ATM. And then the third John had mentioned was related to the vendor and technician robberies of those trying to service the machines. One of the other things we are seeing during 2022 is while the hook and chain remain the top tactic used. We have seen a little bit of a decrease in that tactic, but we've seen the increases in the brute force and the attacks on vendors and technicians with it. Um, I know Brad or David had mentioned early on the connection to Texas when looking at physical attacks. One of the other things that we are seeing related to Texas is while they uh, continue to be the top state with the number of physical tax on ATMs. We are also seeing a connection with those individuals that are traveling outside of Texas and committing these crimes in other states. I know here in FBI Minneapolis, we have had connections related to the vendor technician um, robberies as well as the hook and chain with um, individuals associated in Texas. One of the other things that we have seen impact the physical attacks related to ATMs is the power of social media. Social media showing, uh, like John had mentioned, the security mitigation measures that can be implemented to help protect and try and deter those individuals from gaining access to the ATMs. As the subjects of uh, our investigations, as they analyze and look at those mitigation measures, as soon as they find a way to bypass those, they are posting those out on social media. So what we see then is within the next 24 to 72 hours, we will see an increase uh, related to whatever was posted out on social media, whether they're posting a way to, um, with the hook and chains or whether they're posting ways to look at the bypassing mitigation measures, measures that have been installed at the ATM. In looking at it from a federal perspective, which is what I would be doing as part of uh, the FBI, is our local partners would be the first on scene with it, and they would reach out and collaborate with us from a federal perspective. We would then look at opening an investigation and assisting with the investigation and trying to determine those that were involved in, in the ATM incident. But when it comes to federal prosecution, would really depend on the jurisdiction of the U.S. Attorney's Office on where those specific criminal um, acts took place. So for example, here in FBI Minneapolis in the state of Minnesota, looking and working with US Attorney's Office here in the District of Minnesota, we would, while we would open a case and we would assist our local partners in terms of prosecution, the things we would look at would be serial offender, looking at their criminal history, any ties to gangs, as well as any level of violence. Was a weapon used? Was anybody injured during the incident? So all those would come into play in determining where would be the best place to prosecute an investigation as it moves along and, do, and individuals have been identified. And is it better at a state level or is it better at a, at a federal level in terms of prosecution with it? So those are types of things that we would look at in terms of um, prosecuting those cases. Um, 
I will turn it over to Dave and we can see what kind of questions we have from the audience. Thank you, Brenda, and I'll uh, turn it back over to uh, Dave and his staff to uh, handle those questions. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much to all, all of you. Uh, very informative uh, presentations uh, there. Uh, Jessica has some questions that have been submitted that uh, we're going to pose to the uh, panelists. Great, thank you. Um, so I believe this question goes to David uh, overall in the ATM industry. What do you think the primary cause is for a steep increase in ATM crime? Well, we, we honestly think that 1 of the biggest reasons that we have uh, there is just the fact that the, the penalties are so low. I mean, it's a very low risk type of crime. Um, we're seeing that, uh, you know, most of these, it's on the state level. So that, uh, uh, you know, if you're, even if you're caught and convicted, it's a property crime and, and Brad had talked about that as well. It, it's maybe not that much different than stealing, uh, you know, a six pack of beer from the convenience store from the standpoint of pen penalties. So, uh, you know, we think that is, uh, you know, probably one of the, the root causes is just an easy crime and uh, very little uh, consequences. and. Uh, we we see now that at a federal level they've introduced a bill to uh, make that a a felony with up to 20 years in prison. So we're we're hoping that that uh, that bill gets passed and and maybe we'll see some changes in the trends here. Excellent, thank you. Hey Jessica, it's Brenda. Can I jump in there for a second? Yeah, please do. Thank you. So just to reiterate what David has said, in in addition to that, in working is to determine where is it best to prosecute, whether it's at a federal level or a state level. Like David had mentioned, you know, if there's no level of violence with it, there's no weapon used or somebody getting um, injured, then it does move more toward the state level. But one of the other things impacting that is depending on the communities that are hit, like looking here at FBI Minneapolis, where we have a significant increase in violent crime, that does come into, into play in terms of what resources that, whether it's at the county level or it's at the federal level, that they can and have available to them to work these types of investigations from a prosecution perspective on it. I just wanted to point that out. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, and please, if anyone can answer as, as we go through these. Um, the next question is, are, is there an option to install a gas or explosive monitoring device to alert for a gas attack? Um, I can take that one. That's kind of one of those, um... Uh, one of the indicators I had said that there's a, a fairly new device that, that we're currently in testing with that it, it hears and it learns behavior. So it could any kind of drill or any kind of thing that's out of the ordinary. It can actually hear that and then shut the machine off and, and notify. So there's oxyacetylene blood, you know, explosions stops. It, it's still going to happen, but at least it's going to notify before it happens. So you're able to get more footage. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and maybe this is for, for John, but um, anyone again, um, is there a time of day when these armed attacks are most likely to occur? Oh, I think you're on mute. Here we go. Let me have it on mute there for a second. Yeah, the um, actually they can occur anytime, but the generally most of the attacks that we see are between uh, 9 a.m. in the morning and 1 p.m. in the afternoon. It happening earlier in the day and uh, actually earlier in the week as well. So, uh, you know, in case you're wondering about that as well, Monday, Monday is usually the busiest day for attacks, followed by Tuesday and Wednesday. And again, it can happen any day of the week, but generally that's when we're seeing the attacks occurring. And can I jump in with kind of a follow up question for all the panelists here in terms of these attacks that are occurring? You know, are these local gangs or is this a very coordinated, organized, more regional or, or national uh, effort going on? Yeah, I can, uh, let me, uh, oh, I am on mute. Yeah. So yeah, the, uh, I know in the recent string of attacks we just dealt with in Los Angeles, uh, three attacks in a row and, you know, in less than 45 days, all by the same gang. They just took them in custody, by the way. Uh, they did an excellent job. Uh, the VCTF here took care of that for us, by the way. Uh, excellent work on their part, uh, along with the sheriff's department. But yeah, they tend to uh, 
be localized. What we've seen in the Texas market, Texas and New Orleans and some of those neighboring states, uh, for a period of time, some of those people that were uh, perpetrating those robberies would originate in Texas and then move out to some of the local areas outside of Texas. And uh, because of the concentrated effort by law enforcement in Texas, they would go over to Louisiana, uh, go up to Oklahoma and uh, attack in those areas as well. But generally, uh, they are gang driven. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, it's not exclusive. I know that in uh, Los Angeles, we're looking at several gangs um, you know, that are doing attacks. So one of them has already been taken into custody and we're working on the rest. Excellent, thank you. Um, so this is a two part question. What are some effective physical measures to defend against the smash and grab or the hook and chain ATM attacks? Bullard poles don't seem to prevent these attacks and are uh, in the hook and grab, are they able to grab open the money chest? Who wants to take that one? I mean, I, I, I can, I can opine on that a little bit. So we, we noticed that when the big banks started using the crossbars, especially in the Houston area, they, they dropped to, they dropped significantly so that those weren't recurring until they just figured out how to break the bars off and then seal them. So it's really about around those construction areas where they're using construction equipment and fairly organized where they can pull the ATM off its foundation. Um, what I can say from the, from the other chain gangs, it's really just about the placement of the ATM and to put effective countermeasures around it, meaning if you have an ATM that's in the convenience store, that's not bolted down properly, that's towards the glass itself, then it's a high, it's a high risk area for it to be to be stripped out. So, um, but if you have you know, the bad guys are typically fairly lazy, so they're they're going to go to the path of least resistance. Um, and smaller ATMs, you know, they weigh less. Uh, the other th the other side of it is that you know until the banks start you know. Um, effectively using um, appropriate cash management to where they're not filling ATMs full of cash, they're using it for appropriately uh, forecasting of cash. Uh, there's a lot of the ATMs don't need that much money inside them to begin with, so it's a lot less at risk that way as well. Yeah, I would also uh, I would add that um, some of our uh, customers that we deal with have also uh, deployed GPS trackers in. Uh, their uh, cassettes uh, that have been effective uh, in, in it, it's more of an after the fact issue when it stop it, but helps you mitigating it after it occurs. And that's been effective. And as I said during when I spoke, I think it's very important to have good CCT coverage in and around that area so that you can uh, you know see see what you can uh, glean from that uh, perspective. Great, thank you. Uh, I have a feeling this. This question might cause some dialogue. Um, when will more in the industry stop authorizing withdrawals on fallback transactions? If the issuer won't authorize, uh, then the fact that the card is compromised skimmed. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I can comment on that a little bit. I'm not necessarily an, an expert, but I, I do hear from uh, our members, uh, primarily independent operators, that uh, the, the fallback requirements keep shrinking and changing as far as the limits that they're allowed to uh, to, to go to here, and and that's causing some problems. Uh, you know, just because. Uh, uh, some of the operators now have to think, well, you know, do I want to risk. Uh, you know, exceeding my fallback limit, or should I just uh, turn down this transaction and, and, and not take it at all? So, uh, I, I I don't have a solution for the problem, but you know, I, I recognize that it's out there, and uh, you know, we do talk to uh, the card schemes about it on a regular basis, and uh, you know, try to make sure that uh, you know those things are, are equitable and make sense across the board. But uh, I I know where the question's coming from anyway. <laughs> Yeah, and there's kind of a follow up uh, similar question. Does tapping your card versus inserting your card at the ATM prevent skimming? Uh, yes, I mean, the, 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 the contacts or tap is a different type of cyber crime completely. So 
the skimming is when they're actually catching catching the, the details of the card itself and defaulting to where you use the pen number to validate. But I guess question follow up, Brad, would be, you know, have there been any incidences where people have have put like they do on the card readers, false card readers, they put some sort of fascia over the tap reader and they're trying to, you know, intercept that near field communication data. Yeah, David, you may know more about the near field because that's that's fairly recent in our, our data collection. So. Actually, I'm not sure whether or not that that data comes through uh, on that. I mean, we, we've had uh, eavesdropping types of attacks at you know, a little, little different type of attack, of course, because that's mainly on the read heads, but uh, this is the same, you know, whether or not the same uh, concept could be used on the, uh, the contact list. I, I don't uh, know the answer to that. Okay. Thank you. We'll do a little bit more research on that because I, I know on near field communication, that data is encrypted. Um, plus, you know, it's using generally a token. So instead of the real account number. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we're approaching the top of the hour here. I, I want to thank each of you, uh, David, Brenda, uh, John, Brad, uh, very insightful, uh, commentary on, on this issue that I know is, is of great uh, interest. Uh, I want to thank our audience, uh, for participating, uh, with your attention and, and your questions, just as a reminder. Uh, recording of the webinar, as well as the presentation deck and a transcript uh, will be posted on our website uh, here with, within uh, a week. Uh, we would ask uh, the participants to uh, respond to a survey that's going to pop up at the end of the webinar. Uh, we use that survey, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, to provide valuable feedback, uh, to make sure that the content that we're providing is of value uh, to the audience, as well as to uh, ask you what topics in the future you would like us to address. Uh, I'll take just a minute to put a plug in next Thursday at the same time, one o'clock. Uh, we have another webinar, our third of the year, on the financial exploitation of aging adults. And then we'll do our year-end uh, payments and review wrap-up uh, tradition web, uh, traditional webinar that we do at the end of the year, and that will be on December 15th. So I hope that uh, everyone will register for that as well as subscribe to our, our weekly blogs to keep posted on these types of payment issues. Thank you all for joining us today. Take care. Have a great day. Have a good day.